Pandemic and the peace. Take an invisible, rapidly spreading virus. Pull together hundreds of thousands of people in close quarters, then disperse them abroad in crowded transport. Send them into street celebrations around the world without regard for social distancing. That recipe may sound like the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's hindsight, not 2020. In 1918, a virulent strain of influenza was first observed at Camp Funston in Fort Riley, Kansas on March 11. Individual cases rapidly boiled over from ordinary flu symptoms into the most shocking pneumonia doctors had seen. The mortality rate was 20 times that of the typical influenza. All too successfully dispersed worldwide Via shipping routes, it was dubbed the Spanish flu because only the Spanish press was allowed to report on the havoc wrought among the general population. It had a genuine pandemic, easily spread with the help of troops and modern transport. By the time the third wave had washed over the globe, a fifth of the world was infected. It struck seniors and babies and young men in their prime with particular vengeance, dropping as many troops as the war itself. From Le Fairmont in Arras, a Canadian soldier named Cecil Tyrell wrote to his wife on June the 29th, 1918. Budsy dear, well, you will notice that I too have missed a week in writing, but my excuse is good and an honest one. Our ambulance base covered more miles in the last two weeks than they have since we have been in France. We have had three or four moves in the last two weeks, but apart from that, we have been running day and night hauling Spanish flu patients. I guess you have read in the papers about the influenza plague. Well, we are certainly getting our share of it in France now. I think Fritz's army is also suffering from the plague from the reports of the prisoners taken lately. In fact, it is rumored that that was the reason their offensive was given up. We have been sleeping in our cars for a long time, but we don't like to take chances now that we are hauling so many flu patients. I think that is how Harry caught it. In America, the Red Cross created a national committee to deal with the flu, and they rallied resources from military and civilian sectors. Public health authorities had just one ace in the hole. People were already accustomed to the demands of nationalism and privations of war, rationing their sugar, sending their sons to fields of slaughter, foregoing church attendance, working staggered shifts, abbreviating funerals, wearing masks. These were demands they wearily decided they could live with. On October 22, 1918, Emily Adams of Toronto wrote to her soldier son, George Walter Adams. I expect you have heard we have two epidemics, one Spanish influenza, the other pneumonia. It has become so serious that theaters and picture shows are closed and churches are only allowed to have one service. The Arlington Hotel is turned into a hospital, also Mossop House. You will be sorry to hear Frank Bressator died of pneumonia last week and last Tuesday, Harry Tucker died of it in Ottawa. It seems the previous Saturday, Aunt Eva got word that he had the flu so she and Mabel went to see him. When they got there, he had been taken to May Court Emergency Hospital as he had pneumonia. Fred Hall went to fetch the body and told Charlie there were 60 bodies on the train. Well, Harry was buried last Friday. Edie and Nora wouldn't let me go to the funeral in case of infection. It certainly is good of Mabel to write you such long letters. I'm sorry to say she is still in bed with the flu. Edie phoned Nellie yesterday. She was going on all right, but Mrs. Swan is still ill too. 
your loving mother, Emily Adams. Oddly, perhaps the worst setback in the battle against the flu came with the armistice. Wild with joy, people went crazy with the news that on November 11th, hostilities ceased. The flu was forgotten, and so was social distancing. People hugged and kissed neighbors and total strangers alike, and the virus leaped from carrier to victim, hand to shoulder, mouth to cheek. Guelph, Ontario soldier Robert Shortreed wrote to his mother the day after armistice amid Paris throngs. You will have heard the good news that the armistice has been signed, which is at least the beginning of the end, if not the end. Anyway, it is being celebrated as the end here. Yesterday, Paris was crazy with joy and streets were impassable for people. Today is going to be almost as bad. Flags are to be seen everywhere. The French way of showing their joy is to kiss everyone, and few people escaped it yesterday. Of course, the soldiers came in for their share. Parades were innumerable, and I was in one of British soldiers headed by the Horse Guards band. But it was impossible to get through the crowd, and the band did not have a chance to walk let alone play. It was simply a mob all day long, he wrote. 